This is Ben Woodford here at Modern Education Radio Hour on 90.1 KZSU Stanford. This is a show where we dig into everything from current research trends to far out ideas concerning any topic even remotely related to education. I'm Ben Woodford, your host here in the studio. I'll be with you every Friday from 3 to 4 p.m. for your commute. Here at Modern Education, we bring cutting edge ideas, philosophical discussions, insights from experts, and just about everything else you want to know. The goal is to help listeners interact with and understand learning in all its forms. If you have questions or suggestions for the show, you can tweet at Ben Woodford one on Twitter. I'll do my best to include your ideas in future shows. If you're a teacher, parent, student, or anyone interested in our collective future, I hope you'll tune in each week as we examine new ideas and interview guests from a variety of backgrounds. We're back in the studio here in KZSU. I'm your host, Ben Woodford, and I have my guest today, Rachel Olney. To, today's guest is a PhD student here at Stanford, a mother of two and a wife. She also works with Department of Defense and is a mechanical engineer. Rachel's the CEO of a startup and a real go-getter as far as I can tell. I want to say welcome and get Rachel on the mic here. Hey, Rachel, how are you? Good. How are you? Oh, fantastic. I really appreciate you coming in to talk with me today. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. So... I just want to jump right in and give our listeners a little bit of a picture of who you are and kind of how you got to where you are today. So uh, starting with that, I think, you know, attending Stanford's a really exclusive thing that people have, you know, plenty of ideas and perceptions about what that means. But I'm curious if you could take us back to before Stanford and maybe just tell us about your experiences as a high school student and your attitudes and habits that helped you get to where you are today. Wow, that's a really long time ago. I know. Um, I'm all the way at my PhD now. Um, high school, so I grew up in southern New Mexico um, in Mesilla, but I went to a school called Mayfield High School. Um, it's I really loved growing up in New Mexico, but it was a very different experience than what I've had here at Stanford. Our schools were pretty, pretty underfunded. Um, I think one of the other high schools in town was actually technically unsafe for people to be in because it was, you know, literally cracking in half. Um, but I had a few really supportive educators, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so a science teacher specifically, um, and also a, a, you know, uh, what do you call them? Guidance counselor, Mm -hmm. um, who really helped inspire me to think about what I could do after high school beyond just the typical pathways. Um, There were not that many people from my school or from our region that would go on to top tier schools. Um, So it was seen as something that was pretty far out of reach. Yeah. And it took a lot of, a lot of support. And then also just, you know, a bit of relentlessness, um, I think, to to make that decision. And also really early on, I made some huge pivots, right? Originally, I thought, okay, I want to be an astronaut, right? Uh, and I naturally, was, naturally, yeah. I was determined. Probably through midway through high school, my mother, who was a um, electrical engineer and a ceramics engineer, and had worked on on rockets and missiles and all sorts of things, through some of her connections, was able to send me off to spend about a week with an astronaut. And I saw what he did, and I realized I was not interested at all yeah. in becoming an astronaut, <laughs> um, which was, you know, as a what, 16 year old at the time, really demoralizing. Um, I thought I had a really clear picture of my future and it turned out that was not something that I wanted to do. And so I kind of went back and had to recalculate and try to figure out, okay, what's next? Um, Around that time, I saw a documentary on some really new cool prosthetics and I was like, oh, you know, biomedical engineering, that is my jam. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, ended up going to a summer camp at MIT where we got to see, you know, some of the greatest labs in the world doing that sort of work. Yeah. And with that, again, I realized that was not what I wanted to do. <laughs> and so, again, I was I was retrying to figure it out. And around that time, I applied to, you know, as many schools as I could. And, you know, 
amazingly got into Stanford as well as some other schools and decided to come here because there was flexibility that first year. Um, having been so determined to become a couple of things a couple of times and realized that they were not for me once I got into them, I wanted a school that really excelled in enough areas for me to ex continue exploring. Um, so that's, that's definitely how it happened. Um, I, you know, there were also schools that I was rejected from that I wanted to go to and, and you kind of, you get those wins and you get those losses and you make the best decision you can. And luckily I had some fantastic decisions, um, as well as a scholarship, which was, which was really, really helpful. Yeah. Um, I had the Bill and Melinda Gates, um, the Gates scholarship that they offered, Unfortunately, they don't offer it anymore, but, you know, it paid for my undergrad, my master's, and now is partially funding my PhD. Um, and those sorts of opportunities are just priceless. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. There's just so much, there's so much within that little bit that you've already shared. I'm thinking about, first of all, this sampling thing that you're, you're describing, right? We've got all these dreams. You specifically have all these dreams that you're thinking about. And when you're 16 years old, you really don't know if your dreams are going to pan out. You know, you want to be an astronaut. Great. But what does that actually mean? And it sounds like you had a, a unique opportunity because you were able to dig in and actually see what that meant. Right. And, to simulate it almost. Right. Yeah. And that's a really important piece that I think a lot of people miss. You hear all these stories about people going to college and getting a degree and then end up working at Starbucks. And there's nothing wrong with working at Starbucks, but we generally don't need a degree to do that. And so it's this, you know, this committing before we really know what we're committing to that seems to cost a lot of people money and time, years of their lives yeah. to do something they don't know necessarily if it's good. Absolutely. And what's really interesting is I ended up here at Stanford doing the product design program, which I think is incredibly valuable and a wonderful program. Um, but one of the things they teach is this rapid iteration mm -hmm. and, you know, low resolution prototyping, prototype something as inexpensively as you can or as quickly as you can to learn from that and then and then continue to make decisions. And thinking back to those experiences, that's exactly what was happening. Of course, there were some other sillier things that happened as well, right? So probably in middle school, I was like, I'm going to be a supermodel. That's, I am determined, <laughs> right? Um, and luckily I had very supportive parents that whatever it was that I decided I was going into head first, they were like, all right, let's do it. Yeah. Um, and after one day of having people mess with my face and my hair and take pictures of me, I was like, no, <laughs> this is not for me. Yeah. Um, and you know, that, that early on dabbling in lots of different things and having the space and the support to do that was, was really important. Yeah. Yeah. At one point I thought I was going to be an engineer yeah. and then I followed around an engineer for a few days and I, I had a similar feeling as you described with the yeah. astronaut. It's like, oh, maybe I don't want to be an engineer, but that's okay because you are an engineer. Right. So maybe we can jump into that since I just sort of accidentally brought us to that topic. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about, so you, we, we've sampled some different subjects and you've played with some different concepts that you might want to do. How do you finally settle on becoming an engineer? I think that I chose this path because it was something that I just couldn't stop myself from doing. I just loved it so much. Um, so specifically, I mean, engineering is a really, really broad, broad area. There are so many kinds of engineers. So even within that, um, searching out and finding what you love is a task, right? Um, so first finding that product design program, just loving this idea of finding what my very first advisor here at Stanford, Banny Banerjee, called um, wicked problems. Problems that just feel like they can't be solved mm -hmm. and finding those and figuring out all the components to them to solve them. Um, and I really loved that. So that's really what pulled me in. Um, later on in the more technical side of the degree, apart from the just straight problem solving, was manufacturing classes. Um, so Stanford has some really tricky classes around manufacturing. And I just found that I really love the pragmatism and the 
ability to actually create things that you can hold in your hands that exist in the world that if you design something it may end up going out to millions of people um, and the opportunity and responsibility of deciding how those things were designed and manufactured and doing it in a sustainable way and doing it um, in a cost effective way I found that to just be really enticing wow yeah so it really brought you into a place where you were digging in deeper yeah. and wanting to be there exactly so exactly. you found your passion it sounds like right exactly and you know I I think there are these little moments where you realize that you found it as I was sitting I think I was like sitting on the stairs one day and taking apart the vacuum because it was broken and as I was taking it apart to like clean something out, I'm sitting there and I found this piece, this part that had been injection molded and the way they had injection molded it was really clever. Mm -hmm. And I got so excited and I like ran up to my husband and I was like, look at this, this is awesome. Like they did this thing and it was so clever. Like I've never seen something manufactured this way. And he was just like, oh my goodness, you are <laughs> such a nerd. And I was like, I know, I love this, you know? Um, and I think to find a profession that gets you that, the, that gets you that excited um, is really, really ultimately the goal. Um, of course I didn't end up doing a lot of manufacturing, but it's still something that I love. Right. Right. And it's that excitement that yeah. makes you want to keep doing it. Right. Exactly. When you find these little moments where you're thinking, wow, I want to be this clever. Right. Yeah. And so you dig in and learn more. And Right. And the problems are just like addictive. You know, you're just right. like, oh, my gosh, I have to solve this. Um, I heard this entrepreneur who made payroll management software once um, talking and he was like, well, I was laying awake one night. And I couldn't stop thinking about this one issue with payroll management. And it was like, it made me laugh because it was that same level of passion over something that I would care nothing to solve. Like I, I would hate to sit around trying to figure out payroll management. That would not be fun to me. Um, but luckily we all have very diverse interests. Um, and I think realizing that is also very important because when you're somewhere like Stanford, there are a lot of really incredible people with really incredible passions and dreams and, and resumes. Um, and you look around and sometimes your bias can be towards, oh, they're really excited about that thing. So maybe I should be excited about that thing. And maybe you should. And maybe their passion has ignited a passion in you. But also to realize that everybody has very different interests and that that's such a good thing. Right, right. And that's the, the I think what you're alluding to here is the specialization that mm -hmm. humanity has come to. We started out, everybody would look for food and everybody had the same job, find food today so that we can eat tonight, right? And as we've progressed through agriculture and all these different technological advances, we've built in specialization as the backbone of how society works. We all pick yeah. a little niche and we don't have to know how to make shoes or make jackets. We can go to work every day and do our thing and then buy those other things. Yeah. And there's so many times here that somebody um, will tell me about something they're working on. And my one thought is, oh, I am so happy that someone so brilliant is working on that problem because yeah no single one of us can solve all of the problems. Right, right. And, and someone needs to solve that problem, yeah. but it's not going to be me. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. So I want to also talk a little bit about, so we're talking about education and we're talking about your entrance into engineering, right? Right. And I know in engineering, there is a, a, a firm gatekeeper that stops a lot of people from ever getting the chance to do engineering and computer science and a lot of these, you know, these modern high paid jobs that a lot of people seek. Yeah. And do you know what I'm going to say for the, what the gatekeeper <laughs> is? It's math. Yeah. <laughs> and personally, yeah. as a mathematician, I feel insulted a little bit that math becomes this gatekeeper to stop people from accessing. Right. Just talking about math. Math is making me like sweat a little. You oh, know? I it's think I see a little sweat terrifying. on your brow there. Yeah. <laughs> so let's talk about that. Can you dive yeah. into that fear a little bit for me and yeah, tell me absolutely. where it comes from and where these, ex where your experiences have been around math? Yeah, absolutely. Um, going back to the very beginning, when we were talking about high school. You know, I thought I was fantastic at math. Um, 
I just was, you know, crushing it in high school. Um, and then I got here to Stanford and a few years later, I ended up seeing that, that our school district is on average two grade levels behind. Um, but I didn't realize that when I got here to Stanford. And so I go into, you know, the lowest level math class they teach here. Which is what? Just for context. Uh, it's like an introduction to calculus. Okay. essentially, yeah. right? So I had actually already taken calculus twice. Mm -hmm. um, once in like an AP class in my high school, once actually at our local university, they had allowed me to, to take university classes. Um, and even still, when I took it here at Stanford, I was not meeting the same level as my classmates. Um, and that was really difficult. Um, and math is just one of those things that unless you are spending every day looking at it, not all day, every day, but some time every day, familiarizing yourself with, you know, with the equations that you need to know, with the different routes to problem solving through proofs and things like that, um, it's very easy to fall behind. And so, you know, I spent a lot of my years in undergrad just you know, panicking, hoping I would mm -hmm. pass these math classes, you know, and as an engineer, you know, math is very important. Um, as I got later in my career, of course, I switched to using things like MATLAB, certain basically computer based, you know, you write code and the code does the math sort of things. Um, and once I got into that, I was a lot more comfortable, but I don't think I entered Stanford with the, the baseline language that I needed to speak the same language as the professors and as the rest of the students. And that's hard um, because when you're somewhere like Stanford and especially in your first years at Stanford, you want to live up to what you think they're expecting of you. And you don't want to openly admit that you're struggling, which is the worst possible thing you could do. Mm -hmm. um, and for me at the time, you know, I'd, I'd be sitting there with another student and they'd be like, oh, well, that's this. And I'd be like, okay, give me a few minutes. I'm going to sit here and stare at my paper and try to figure out what, like, w you know, what is it that you just figured out, first of all? And also while I'm doing that, sit here panicking about why is it taking me so much longer than it's taking you to learn this? Um, and it wasn't until much later in my education that I became comfortable with being able to just tell people, oh yeah, I don't, I don't understand that. Can you under, can you just explain it to me? Um, and going and getting that that repetition from as many people as possible who are willing to help you learn the material, rather than you know trying to brave it alone. That's that's not brave. It's foolish. Right, right. How do you think your experience in school would have been different if you learned that sooner? Um, I think it would have been just as hard, but I would have done better um, okay. because there's no getting around learning being hard. That's part of what makes it fun, right? It's, it's that challenge. Like we were talking about when you find those challenges that you just can't wait, um, to tackle. But the difference is that you will learn so much more during that same amount of time because you will, you will, instead of staring at your paper, panicking, trying to figure out the problem and trying to like muscle your way through it, you'll actually learn how to come up with those clever things like that injection molding, right? Um, that we talked about earlier, that person who really knew what they were doing, that was able to look at it in a clearer way. Right, right. So right. it sounds, uh, what I'm hearing you describing is this, the intelligence of admitting that you're stuck or that you need help. Yeah. And there's a lot of times people, you know, teachers or parents want to just tell people, well, just buckle down and stop complaining and get it done. Right. Right. And while there are times where that's relevant, right, if you already know how to do what you're doing and you already have a clear understanding of how to accomplish it, procrastination stops us and distractions stop us. But that's not the same as trying trying to learn something new. And I think you just gave a, a, a shiny gold nugget for our listeners here, which is ask for help. Stop being stubborn or trying to hide that you don't know and instead- Or being too prideful. Yeah, let your pride go long enough to get the help you need because it will make that same struggle more fun, more enjoyable, have, you'll have support from other people. Right. And that's huge. So, so as somebody who, who during my time at Stanford has always struggled with math, um, you know, in, in the last math class that I took, I was writing a MATLAB code to, to solve something and I finally cracked it. And you just, it's so exciting to finally do those things. Um, 
but you can't do them if you don't know what you're doing. Um, and it's not to say that you can't try to work through them yourself, but it's just that, you know, there's only, you shouldn't be beating yourself up for not knowing things that you just don't know. Um, now, if you don't know them because you're not studying or because you're not going to lecture or because you're not trying, like there's a, a larger problem there around motivation. Um, but if you are trying, that's, that's the point where you need to start asking for help. Yeah. And so many students get to that point and then they throw their hands up and say, maybe this isn't for me. Right. Or they think they're not good enough, right. which is not at all true. It's just purely that you need a little bit of help and that's totally fine. That is what your teachers are there for. That's what your TAs are there for. And they would love to help you. Most of them TA or teach that class because they love this subject and they would be excited to work through it with you. Right, right. Oh, that's such great advice. So thank you for sharing that. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Now, I also want to go back a little bit because you were talking about this. I think what you were alluding to is a little bit of the imposter syndrome when you first show up here. Yeah. And uh, you're familiar with the term? Absolutely. Can you explain for the audience what your understanding of imposter syndrome is? Yeah. Or, and then maybe some of your experiences so dealing with that? Imposter syndrome is essentially feeling like an imposter. Um, during the commencement or the like very, is that what it's called? Commencement at the beginning of school? No, that's the end. Uh, I don't know. Whatever they call it at the beginning <laughs> Orientation? of- Orientation? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Whatever they call the speech at, you know, when they welcome a new class, they, they told all of us, you're not here by mistake. You're yeah. meant to be here, right? Um, but imposter syndrome is basically feeling like somehow you've ended up here. People think that you are capable of something or that you are something, um, but you're not. You, you feel like you're not good enough, that you're not going to live up to that. Um, and I think, you know, a little bit of stress around feeling like you're not going to live up to things is probably good. It can drive you harder, um, but too much of it is a really bad thing. I would say a tiny bit of it is good. A moderate to large amount is all bad. Um, yeah. But feeling like an imposter is is definitely something I think a lot more Stanford students feel than they, than they would want to admit. Here we tend to also call it, well, it's a little bit different, but a second half to this is duck syndrome, okay. which well, is essentially, is? yeah, because you have imposter syndrome, you want to look like a duck on the surface, very smooth and gliding along. Um, but underneath the surface, you're treading as fast as you can to stay afloat. Mm -hmm. And a lot of students feel that here at Stanford. Um, and, and everywhere and all over the place, I would imagine. Um, I only can speak to here, but it's, it's something a lot of people feel where it's like you have to have it together on the surface. Um, and you're not willing to share your struggles outwardly because you don't feel that other people have those same struggles. Um, and it's a major problem with undergraduates at Stanford and, and probably most students across the US. Yeah, absolutely. Is there a story maybe you can think of of where mm. you've either faced this and it's hurt you or faced this and uh, how you overcame it to get what you needed? Hmm. Let me think. Take your time. I'll just describe. She has a very <laughs> thoughtful look on her face right now, probing her inner thoughts to try to figure out. I mean, so I, so during my undergrad, I also had a little bit of an unusual circumstance in mm. that I had my daughter with me here at Stanford at the time. Um, and so I felt the need to not ask for any exceptions and to, to do everything exactly the same as the other students, despite, despite the fact that I was a, I was a parent, I was one of the only parents, um, right. as a Stanford undergrad. And, you know, I would, I was determined to turn in everything at the exact same time as the other students in the exact same form, even like ridiculous standards where it was like, I, if I want to feel like I belong here, I need to look like everybody else. Um, and I can't let anybody see how hard I'm struggling to like keep up with this. Um, so I know in one of my engineering classes, we had a, a large, um, assignment that was due. And that same week I was traveling across the U S, um, to go, to go visit my husband who was in the military at the time. And I was panicking because I wasn't going to be able to turn in my assignment on the time on time. And I didn't want to admit to the fact that I was struggling to meet this deadline, despite some pretty extraordinary other things happening in my life. Um, and finally at the, at the end of the course, you know, I, I made it happen despite everything else. I was like, this is, go I'm going to make this happen. You know, at an extreme toll, right. Yeah. Um, probably didn't sleep for a couple of days, probably, you know, was so stressed beyond belief. Um, 
at the end of the course, I was standing there talking to someone um, and the professor came up and he was like, hey, so-and-so just told me that like, you also like have a kid and a husband in the military. And if you ever needed anything, you could have let me know. And I was like, no, no, I handled it. But like deep down, I was like, oh my gosh, even just a one day extension when I was like out of town would yeah. have been really nice. Yeah. Um, but you know, at that time I was so determined to fit in um, that I was unwilling to, you know, to look around and say, you know what, maybe I should just hand this assignment in the next day to the professor rather than trying to, you know, send it to someone else to print and have them turn it in and, you know, cause a whole mess that didn't need to happen just right. because I wanted everything to seem super smooth on the surface. Yeah. And that's, I think, a very common feeling. We all want to look like we got it all under control. We all want to get everything in on time. So we're not asking for special favors. Yeah. Has that changed for you since then? Um, in some ways. So I still think that with really good planning, um, first of all, a lot of those things could have been avoided. Mm -hmm. um, so I know now I am far more organized and I'm thinking much further ahead on everything. And okay, how are we going to handle this? These two things might be happening at the same time. How are we going to create contingencies um, and coming up with backup plans for things? Um, but the other piece is that I'm now more willing to ask for exceptions when I know that this is an exceptional situation. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, if it's something small and it's on me, I just need to handle it. But, you know, for instance, with, with my PhD itself, there wasn't a program for it. There wasn't necessarily um, a researcher or a professor who was working on what I wanted to do, but I knew that the research I wanted to conduct was really important and something that mattered and, and that I was willing to fight to make it happen. And so you start asking for exceptions and you start telling people, look, here's, here's in all honesty, the situation, here's what I want to do, here's why I want to do it, and here's how I want to do it. Um, and what I've learned is if you are able to come to people with basically here is the issue that I've identified and I need an exception, you should probably come to them with a plan for how to execute that exception mm -hmm. and why that plan is okay. Um, and now that I've learned to do that, I, I do it quite a lot. Right. Yeah. So what I'm hearing you, you describing is not only planning better and avoiding being in a situation where you've backed yourself into a corner and you feel like you have no way out. So you have to ask for help. Right. So improving the, the front end to make sure you don't get in those situations less. Exactly. But also on the other end of it, you're looking at what you need and valuing that enough to formulate plans and put in the work and the thought so that when you do need an exception, you're making it easy for the other side of that that question, right? Absolutely. And I mean, going back to, to what we were talking about with math, I could have thought ahead on a lot of those things as well. With struggling with that math when I got here to Stanford, um, they actually even offer some like introductory courses during the summer to get students up to speed who feel like they may not be ready. Um, but I was, you know, too prideful for that. I felt that I was prepared um, right. and that I would be fine. And I wasn't. And I, I should have thought ahead of that, like, hey, you know, I'm not coming from one of the top school districts in the nation, a lot of these other students are, I probably need to preempt, um, preempt my education with a little bit of getting up to speed. Um, and then in addition to that, just, just letting the other people around, you know, if you, if you see something coming up in the future. Yeah. So, oh man, this is all such good stuff. <laughs> I'm thinking there's probably a, a fair amount of mothers out there who are trying to go through school as well. I know when I was a kid, my mom was in school and it's tough. It really is. It's a difficult thing. And I'm, I, I'm wondering if you can synthesize some of the, the struggles that you went through and you know how you faced that along the way. Yeah. Um, so I, I actually love being in school with my kids. Um, I think it's it helps with my, my daughter who's six years old in first grade. She's like, mom's in school, I'm in school. We're both in school. And like, it, it gives this relatability to it. But yeah, it is really, really difficult, especially early on when they're really small. Um, I was lucky that I lived on campus. So, so while you're nursing and those sorts of things, my daughter luckily was very close by, um, but I still struggled. And it is hard because unlike a job or some jobs, some jobs follow you home, some of them don't. Um, 
But unlike a job, most of it happens in the evenings. You mm-hmm. know, during the day, you're going to team meetings and meeting with professors and going to classes. And then at night, you have to do all your work and studying. And so it's just a lot of time. And that's really hard to still make sure that you feel like you're spending enough time with your kid. Um, One thing that I think it did provide me that most other students don't have is a great like over under, right? So spending time with my daughter, right? Is this new project or this new activity worth spending less time with her? And it's easy to let that kind of really wear you down, but it's, you start to look at it as, okay, there's this side project or this side thing that I could be doing, but at that same time, I could be hanging out with my kids. Is this worth that time? It gives you a good spot to measure things that I think allowed me to stay a little bit more rational about the number of activities I got involved in while in school. Um, But it is hard because you know, you never know what's going to come up with your kids. You never know what's going to come up with school. Um, my daughter was in daycare and you can't send your kids to daycare sick. And mm-hmm, she had yeah. a really high fever. And I had a large presentation that day, a final presentation for my class. And so I emailed the professor <laughs> again, once I had gotten later and I was willing to like tell people I was, you know, panicking Yeah. Um, and told them, look, my daughter's sick, but You know, I am pretty sure she's just going to sleep all day because she's sick. If you don't mind, I'm just going to bring her. And the professor was like, yeah, that's fine with me. (laughs) And so I just brought her along with me. Um, And I had another class that would always meet on the weekend. So I would just bring her with me. And I think you really one of the best things to do is to get to this point where you're like, yes, I am a parent. And so sometimes my kid is going to come with me. Um, One of the organizations I work with now is really good about that as well. Defense Digital Service. They're in the Pentagon. Um, I think it must be spring break in D.C. or something because, you know, on their on their Slack channel, people are, you know, bring their kids to work if they need to. Um, And it's awesome for many, many reasons. Your kids get exposed to that. They get to see all of these things. Um, Other people get to see other facets facets of your life um, and see that you are multidimensional. But but it is hard. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And it's such an interesting piece of trying to navigate those two worlds and realizing that your, your child is and should be your priority. And then at the same time, you have all these other priorities and you got to figure out where they fit within that hierarchy. Yeah, absolutely. And there's no easy way to do it, I'm sure. No, there isn't. And I don't think that changes once you start working either. Um, I think that you do have to realize that there are a lot, you know, now that my daughter's in school, especially, there are a lot of people that are really good with kids. Like my te- my daughter has had fantastic teachers. Yeah. And so I don't feel like I'm missing out on any of that time with her. Um, when she was in daycare, she was with people with degrees in early childhood education. Like these people were expert at teaching young children and being with young children. I personally am not an expert at being with young children. Right. Like I love my daughter, but I, I'm probably not the best one to teach her how to do math, right? Like I don't know how children and learn math. Um, I'm happy to sit there and and do homework with her or play with her, you know, whatever. But um, I think being willing to accept that you're not the only adult human in your child's life is okay. Yeah. Um, Uh. And I think that that gives you a lot more sanity. Um, You know, I'm lucky enough that, you know, now that my husband's out of the army, he's spending a lot of time with the kids and he is fantastic at teaching, you know, my daughter how to read. He is incredibly patient, all of that. And some of us have that patience to do those things. I don't necessarily. Right. Um, So I've never felt terribly bad about about having other people be involved in her life and helping teach her and those sorts of things. Rachel, that's such a great point you're bringing up. And it's something that I've talked about with other guests on the show from different perspectives. And it's really this this idea of that people in the school system are not only trained and educated and wanting to help you raise your children, but they've got the expertise and put in the time. And, you know, you may have one teenager or one toddler at home And they've got 30 every day and different ones every year. And it's this 
this level of expertise that parents can't even really hope to ever have. They're not going to raise 500 children within one specific age group. So it's not your job. Right. And I think I've always tried to encourage, I used to be a high school teacher and I always used to try to encourage parents that it's more important to take interest in what your kid is doing and do what you were just describing. Be, you can sit with them. You can take interest in what they're doing at school, but you don't need to feel this deep pressure to know everything and be everything. Absolutely. I mean, if you think back to when I was doing those really quick iterations on what I was going to be when I grew up, um, my parents weren't getting overly involved in it. They were just supporting it however they could, right? They knew, okay, if she wants to go do this thing, she's probably not the, we're not the expert at it. So let's find someone who is and let her experience that and experience this and, you know, whatever. Um, um, and and just being there, but not um, getting overly intense about things. Um, like when my daughter was in kindergarten, there were so many, I mean, she's my eldest child. We have a two-year-old as well, but she's, you know, the first one going through each of these stages. And so there were a lot of times that I would go to her teacher and say, hey, so there's this thing happening. Mm -hmm. We are not sure what we think about it. Have you seen her, you know, doing this or that in class or have you, you know, whatever, you know, all sorts of things, just all sorts of questions. And it's so funny because I think especially kindergarten teachers are so used to parents doing that, asking them for advice, saying, mm -hmm. you know, my daughter suddenly has become super stubborn about reading. Like we know she could read and she's just not doing it. What do we do? And she would say, you know, just, she's reading just fine in class. And I'd be like, oh, thank you goodness, because I thought she had just literally forgotten to read, um, you know, and she would say she's reading just fine in class. I'm not worried about her. She's just being stubborn. Just, you know, do it with her every day. But if she if she's really resistant, it's OK. Um, and, and it was a phase and it ended. And now she's fantastic at reading. Um, but there are so many times that those teachers know so much better. And to be honest, they see more of your kids sometimes than you do. They're with them all day. Yeah. Yeah, so. I'm, I'm remembering actually what, you're, what you just described here sounds a lot like what you described on, at, for your own experience as a student, seeking out and asking and being humble enough to accept that I am not the expert at kindergarten reading phases or developmental processes, right? Right. And so you did the same thing in this other area of your life. And it sounds like it's worked out well as far as getting the input and guidance you need from the teachers. Absolutely. And in, um, in design thinking and in the product design program, they actually have a word for it. It's called beginner's mindset. Mm. It's about, you know, being okay with the fact that in, you're a beginner at a lot of things <laughs> yeah. and that that's okay. Yeah. Um, I've taught design thinking to the military. And in that case too, I've had to t remind people, look, this is a new thing. Thing. You don't know what you're doing and that's okay. It's okay to not know what you're doing. You don't have to know everything. There's right. no possible way for you to know everything. Yeah. And if you were an expert already, you'd be teaching the class instead of taking it. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, that's so good. So I, I want to think a little bit now. We, we've talked about your, your, your experience getting into and becoming an owning, taking ownership over your learning, your experience as being a parent. Now I wanted to talk a little bit about your experiences being a woman in a STEM field, especially engineering, and what that's been like for you, some of the obstacles you may have come across and how you dealt with that. Do you have a, a story that can help us understand your view of yourself as a role of the role, taking the role of a, an engineer as a woman? Yeah. So I think I have a huge advantage here, right? Um, my mother was a fantastic engineer. Um, I grew up going to her lab, seeing, you know, pieces of satellites and rockets and all sorts of things being made. Um, and I think for me, it felt very natural to have women in engineering because I grew up around that. Um, and as an adult, it really has not been that much of an issue for me, luckily. Um, there have been a few times, what's really interesting is, actually the way I'm gonna tell this story is through something a bit different. So I did a study abroad in China. And when I first got there, people were looking at me all the time. And I was like, why is everybody looking at me? Because when when you're you, you're not seeing you, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and after I had been there a few months, I saw another, um, you know, another white person walking around. And I was like staring at them, like, what is that person doing here? <laughs> like, <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay, now I get it. So 
So I would say being a woman in engineering can be like that sometimes okay. in that I don't notice myself as a woman in engineering as much. I'm just an engineer and I don't really think about my gender very often. I just do what I'm doing and I know what I've shown up to do and I do that. Um, but then when I run across another woman engineer who's really incredible, I'm always like, oh man, a woman engineer. And I'm like so excited, but it's really interesting because then I understand, oh, that's why maybe other people are reacting to me that way. Um, but I, I don't tend to think about it that much. And I think that really good schools have done a great job of trying to make sure that there is a good mix. Um, and here, here you have that. And so I've never felt particularly outnumbered in my classes. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's not been much of an issue, to be honest. Okay. Um, working in defense, um, so working with the DOD um, a little bit more, just because there I'm even more unusual. Mm. Um, that you know demographic is almost all male in a lot of the places I work. Um, and so there I'll notice more like, oh, okay. People are like, why is she here? Um, but then very quickly you just, you establish rapport, you show up and you expect a certain level of respect because hopefully you've found something that you're passionate about. So because you're passionate about it, you've become an expert at it. And so when you show up to things, you're not, you know, a woman engineer, you're not a male engineer, you're just the best best engineer you can possibly be and you are there to do your job and I think if you if you can show up with that attitude demanding respect um, I, I think that it doesn't for me it has not become an issue I've heard horror stories from lots of other people um, but I've been very very lucky yeah yeah so what I'm hearing is you have this identity of seeing yourself as an engineer and that it's something that you've had lots lots of exposure to other people and other women that present themselves and carry themselves well within that field. So you've had a, a lot of time to become comfortable and just see yourself as who you are and see yourself as the best person for the job, regardless of gender or experience or anything like that. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And I think that with my generation, especially, you know, with my mother, she was like one of the only female engineers at her entire company. Um, but with my generation, we have a lot more role models to look up to. Um, and then the next generation, um, my daughter has even more um, women in every type of role that you can imagine to look up to as well. And there are a lot of women who are engineers and scientists who are doing a lot of work to make sure that there is material to help inspire um, young girls. So for instance, um, there's a woman named Emily Calandrelli and she is a MIT, um, I think she's like an astrophysicist or aero astro, I'm not sure, mm -hmm. engineer, mm -hmm. brilliant engineer. Yeah. Um, and she went on to write a book series that basically displays young girls doing science and engineering in their daily lives as a passion. Um, and that those sorts of resources are so valuable for our kids because my daughter reads that and she goes, oh, I understand what a hypothesis is, right? Um, right. She understands like the basic language that she'll need to succeed in that. Same as we were talking about with math, it being a language and you need to be familiar with that language. Um, and so those sorts of things help set them up for success and give them idols to, to look up to. Right. Yeah. I'm imagine. I'm, I'm thinking something that's been really relevant in the news lately has been, you know, we had two movies come out, the Black Panther movie and the Wonder Woman movie, which both created these superheroes that don't look like the normal white upper class superhero that we're used to seeing. And the amount of impact that had on women and African-Americans and different people who just don't get to see those types of heroes in their lives every day. Yeah, absolutely. And so you had this, your mom sounds like a hero to me because she gave you this worldview of yourself that transcended the sort of male dominated view of what engineering should look like or has at least in the past looked like. Right. And I think also a view of how be, feeling out of place is totally fine, right? Like she, she was there and she felt fine and a lot basically everywhere I go now, um, in, in my research, in my work, I am almost never around people that are like me. Mm. Um, and I think 
I mean, like me in certain, certain regards In some regards they are, we have a lot of similar interests. Um, but being comfortable there and just being like, okay, yeah, I'm different than all of you. And that is a valuable resource. It is great that I am, that I am different from all of you. Um, and just, just embracing that difference, not necessarily trying to, um, homogenize. Um, but, but also, um, my daughter loved hidden figures. She thought that was great. Oh, that's such a good um, movie. Yeah. She was like, wow, they're so good at math. And I was like, yeah, they are. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, well, I wish I could be that good at math. <laughs> you could be. <laughs> I could be. I could be. But it's about whether or not I'm extremely passionate about it. Right. 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 Yeah. And everybody doesn't need to be a mathematician, even exactly. if I think they should, <laughs> or even if I wish they would, <laughs> it's okay. And it probably is best that they aren't. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, oh, nice. My mom texted me. The word is convocation. That's the name for a speech uh, at the beginning of a mom <laughs> academic year. Mom phoning in a friend here. <laughs> this is great. Convocation. Okay. Yeah. So this is all such good stuff. I think you just became a superhero in my eyes and you can be a model for so many people to do all the things that you're doing now. Yeah. I know you're also involved in, in business and Department of Defense and all these other things. Yeah. How does a person any person from any background get to a place where they have so many different varied interests and feel so, you know, sure of themselves or at least secure enough to chase these dreams, even if they seem bigger than us or our capacity as a person? I think that's exactly the reason to do them, right? Um, I think one of the biggest things that drives my um, choosing of projects is finding things that I feel like are way more important than I am as an individual. Um, so with each of each of those projects I've done, what drives them is the fact that this thing is so important and someone needs to do it. Um, and I, there's nobody doing it. And so I will. Um, and, and that's what you're talking about. That determination of deciding, fine, I can do this. Um, and people, I think sometimes we paint this picture and in movies, you know, you see the montage where the person becomes determined and suddenly they can do it. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not how it happens. Not you in know. a two minute music clip. <laughs> no, unfortunately, it would be really nice. But even, you know, with the projects I'm doing now, right? Mm -hmm. um, there's still always that question of, oh my gosh, can't like, can we do this? Is this actually possible? Right. Um, and, I think that if you found those things that are more important than you as an individual, it doesn't become like, can I do this? It's, we have to do this. This, like, I must complete this because if I don't, X, Y, or Z will not be solved. And that will be really bad. Um, so that's, that's a piece of it is allowing the project itself to help drive you mm -hmm. um, and help create that that determination. I think otherwise, if you're just determined in and of yourself, like I can do this thing, whatever that thing is, you're probably just going to become very stubborn um, and disconnected from the reality of what was the goal that I set out for. Right. But if instead it it's framed in your mind as this is a problem, I am sure this is a problem because I have really done my homework to make sure that it is. And now I've set out to solve it. Mm -hmm then it becomes worthwhile. So that's that's essentially what happened with both my PhD and the company that, that I'm starting are that with both of these, it was such a difficult and interesting problem that was not getting solved, that I didn't feel had the manpower behind it to actually get done. Um, so I think that's a piece of it. Um, in terms of like the way you phrased your question was, how do you get to that point? Yeah. I think you just just have at it and you'll have a few failures along the way where you become determined to solve something and then you realize, oh, here's why that didn't work out. And then on each new round, you get smarter. Um, I, I did a project a long time ago around a wearable light for pilots, for, for um, Black Hawk and other helicopter pilots. And the issue was that that product was very military specific and that company couldn't actually survive. Right. Mm. Um, and I learned from that experience. And then the next time I tried to solve a problem, I was like, okay, we need to solve this problem, but we need to be smarter about it this time. And you get smarter. And, and if you look at the histories of a lot of great entrepreneurs or problem solvers, 
they have to just keep going. And there are a lot of failures along the way. I don't think there's a single moment when you're like, okay, I can 100% absolutely do this. Um, it's more of a determination not to quit. It's a, mm -hmm. a resilience and a, a relentlessness that allows you to not quit, yeah. <laughs> to decide that you can't, you can't just stop. You have to keep going. Yeah. And what I'm hearing is that this is partly finding something outside of yourself so it's not all about you because it's maybe not as sustainable to just put it on you like, oh, this is my responsibility, this is my job, but instead say what I'm trying to accomplish is big enough that it's worth looking past my own insecurities or difficulties or lack of belief or lack of resources or whatever it is that you feel is holding you back. Exactly. And really finding something outside you, something bigger than you to put your time into. Yeah, something that you care about and right. something that, you know, and, and finding something that you care about is difficult. Yeah. Um, you have to, you have to find something that will, that problem that'll keep you awake in the middle of the night that you just are determined to fix. Um, and for me, it just happened to be national security. And I really love working on problems with the Department of Defense um, and trying to figure out how we can keep our service members safe, trying to figure out, you know, how we can be more accurate, how we can create less collateral damage, how we can do things more precisely. Wow. Wow. Well, I'm glad you're on the job personally. <laughs> well, one last thing, because we are just about out yeah. of time. How do you deal with failure? What is your approach? What is your mindset? What is your uh, coping mechanisms? How do you deal with it when you do come across, hit that wall or you feel like you've spent your last dime, so to speak? Um, so what I would say is a year ago, I realized that yes, there are failures. So um, with my PhD, right, I was determined to work on this project and I applied to one of the departments at Stanford and I got rejected. Right. So that that project failed. Right. You know, in a lot of people's eyes, it's like, well, your program didn't get accepted. Your research proposal, you know, whatever. Um, but again, if you're determined enough for that problem, you're just like, but this has to be done. Like, I care so much about this research, not, you know, for my own delusional reasons, but because they're all, you know, myself, but a lot of other outside stakeholders care you become determined enough to find a way to do it. Um, mm. There are times where you have to decide that something is done, you know, and you're like, okay, this, we are, we are pulling the plug on this one, yeah. right? Um, and when you do that, you've, you've done everything that you can and you've decided to make a rational decision. Um, and at that point, I still don't think it's necessarily a failure. It's simply a determination that that path is no longer worth the resources it would take to continue. Um, but it is still hard, of course. And I think having a really supportive network, I think being able to be really open about these things, getting them off your chest um, is really great. And I have a great family, you know, my husband and, and the rest of my family as well. I'm probably on the phone with every single person in my family at least once a week, you know, mm -hmm. my dad and my mom and my sister and my brother and everybody. Yeah. And I'll just call them and be like, ah, oh, there's this thing and it's not going how I want it to. And I'll just vent that. Um, and then I'll find a new way forward and I'll just keep going. Um, so that's that's a big piece of it. Okay, so I'm on pins and needles here. You got rejected from this, this oh, yeah. proposal. Oh, yeah. I mean, then I... What happened next? <laughs> but, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I went out and I found other, other professors who were doing research that were similar and kept pitching it until I found one that was like, yeah, this is really cool. I would love to advise you. And I was like, great. Um, and okay. So, Did so you have to I'm make some changes along the way? Or is there um, some adaptation that happens there was, still? There was a little bit. I mean, each professor has their own methodology or their own typical way of doing research. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're speaking to them in a language that they don't understand, it doesn't work, right? Um, right. So originally my, my research was framed very much around the organizations themselves. Um, and that would have fit in more of an organizational type um, department. Yeah. But then I ended up at the Center for Design Research, which actually researches groups that are doing engineering. Um, that, that has a slightly different spin, but it can still complete the same mission that I wanted, which was essentially looking at... Um, 
at cyber capability development groups and looking at what makes them successful at actually creating new technologies. Yeah. Um, what are those inputs? And there's a lot of research around design teams of how you create great design teams. Um, so of course you have to adapt it a little bit. You have to be a little bit flexible, um, but ultimately it still served to to complete the mission that I cared about, which was how can I help, um, you know, Army Cyber Command and and the U.S. military understand how to create new capabilities. Yeah, I'm so glad yeah. there's a happy ending. Does, <laughs> I mean, it doesn't turned always out. have to be a happy ending, but <laughs> the, us the, as Americans, we like that. the scary part about realizing that though is realizing that you're no longer allowed to to just like accept defeat. Like, yeah. Once you realize that if you're determined enough, you can get it done, you now have no excuse to not get it done, um, which is also a terrifying thing to realize. Yeah. And it's such a beautiful way for us to leave off for today. <laughs> Rachel Olney, thank you for coming in today and sharing your insights and your experiences. This has been enlightening to me and hopefully to the listeners as well. I'm sure they've gotten a lot out of this. You're an amazing guest, amazing human being. You got a lot going for you. And I am sh sure you don't need me to wish you luck, but I still wish you the best of luck with everything you do. Thanks, Ben. Thank you. So thank you for tuning into Modern Education. And this has been another broadcast here at KZSU 90.1 Stanford. We are going to play out the last couple minutes of the hour. And thank you again one more time. This is Modern Education on KZSU Stanford Radio.